All right, welcome to a non-sponsored video. Nobody pays us to say anything or to not say anything on this video. Today, we're talking about um, advice you can use at your own risk to hopefully help you repair some aluminum. So, Pete, here's the situation. Some random guy just stops by your shop with his aluminum trailer that, surprise, surprise, needs some repair work. Do you weld them with 4043 or 5356 and why? I can't tell you, my lawyer says. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the I problem know. is if you don't know what it is, if you don't know what the material is, if it's aluminum, you cannot weld it. Safely. Now, not safely. You can't weld it. Even if you have good liability insurance, you can't weld it. So now, of course, if you've been in the business for long enough, you can call the manufacturer. Sometimes they tell you what it's made out of, sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. Typically, a lot of plate and angle and tubing, rectangular tubing that is used in trailer manufacturing is either a 6061 or a 6063 alloy. So that, knowing that, because I've talked to trailer manufacturers, this is what they were using. That doesn't mean every aluminum trailer is made out of those, but this would be a pretty close guess. So there, the, the deal is with those, aluminum comes in like a certain series, like a 6000 series, and then it comes in like a T something, whatever, like T6 or T5 T something, and this is what they call a condition. This has to do with the heat treat and the aging of the aluminum. This has to do with the strength. So a 6000 series aluminum with the right aging can have a tensile strength as high as close to 60,000 PSI. Now the problem is the way how this is made, the aluminum is alloyed, is heat treated and aged and this is how it gains the strength. If you weld this with either 4043 or 5356, your tensile strength will drop as much as two thirds right around the weld area. Your weld is never as strong as your original parent metal is. This is different than steel. Usually on steel the weld is stronger than the metal. On aluminum it's not because the metal is heat treated. So whenever you weld aluminum, be aware, even if you use the correct filler, that your welds are never as strong as the original metal. Now some things, not necessarily a trailer, after they are welded, they're being heat treated. If it's welded with a heat treatable alloy and not with a not heat treatable alloy, and then the weld has the same strength like the rest of the product. Okay. Um, all right, that's good. What if a guy shows up with, um, with an aluminum transmission casing and he's gonna make it into a sink, I mean repair it. What do you weld with on that if it's cast aluminum and why? Probably 4043 because it flows nice, I have it and it works. I would never do this if it was a functional transmission case. What if it because is a functional transmission? If it's a functional transmission case, chances are um, to, to regain the full strength. Mm -hmm. Usually, uh, transmission housings are, according to my um, experience, a 300 series aluminum, mm -hmm. which you would want to use something that is heat treatable because if you restore the heat treat in the transmission, mm -hmm. if the guy even wants to heat treat it, if it's just the empty shell, no gears yeah. in it, and he reheat treats it, then you need to use something that is heat treatable to weld the transmission. Okay. And now you need to know exactly what it is again, because if you use an alloy that is not heat treatable, then it's really only good for a designer sink, whatever. All right, what if it's just the local yokel who, uh, snapped an ear off of it and he's just gonna stick it back into his first gen Camaro or whatever. Yeah. Charge him cash, tell me what's never there and hope you don't get caught. <laughs> <laughs> or have the guy sign a waiver that this is what he wanted. Yeah, I mean are the odds of something like that failing or having issues really all that high? Uh, yes, especially welding a casting because a casting is always a great unknown. You don't know where it came from, you don't know the porosity in the casting, you don't mm -hmm. know what's really in it, how it was heat treated. You don't know why did it fail in the first place. Mm -hmm. Did the guy just drop it or did it fail under load, under strength, where now 
you need to um, now you need to analyze why it failed or how it failed so and if your repair is only one-third as strong as the base metal was your repair most likely will fail again yeah and you know I'm assuming there's possibly other mechanical things to think of you know if the guy drops his transmission or whatever sure it broke there but there might be non-visible cracks around that area maybe something that's fractured and, and nobody realizes it yet maybe it is visible it's under the grease or whatever so I'm sure those things as well probably wouldn't do that's the next thing oil, oil soaked castings real pores yeah do you really want to weld on those at all people fix them every day and some certain things even if they fail again mm -hmm. there is no harm for for uh, health or life yeah and it's you fix it if it fails again big deal it fails again if it holds mm -hmm. up great but whenever think what you do before you do it yeah so I'll say for my own personal business pretty much everything I do comes with a lifetime warranty uh, one of the few things that doesn't are aluminum repairs I'll or a cast that. iron repair casting cast repairs iron in general. repairs as well there's a lot that can go wrong, um, you know, especially if it's on a machine that's been out of production for 30 years from a company that no longer exists. There's really nothing you can do to pull up background information on what exactly that material is, and all that's leaving out everything that it's been through that could cause it stress and, and unseen damage, and then there's all the grease and everything on top of that. So you really have things stacked against you quite a bit. Um, there's just, like I said, there's just too much that can go wrong. And you know, with cast iron, sometimes those casting materials, they throw whatever they have in there before they cast that stuff. So it really might not be the easiest to weld thing in the entire world. However, that being said, I'm not aware of a single cast, uh, cast iron, or for this matter, cast aluminum repair that I've ever done that has failed. Nothing's ever come back. Um, doesn't necessarily mean it's never failed, but I'm not aware of any problems that have ever occurred. And if Pete, you follow, if either. you follow a procedure, if you follow procedure, I welded cast aluminum bumper brackets on semi trucks mm -hmm. where a guy backed over a fire hydrant or whatever and it cracked the cast aluminum bracket. And the bracket was designed to fail first so it doesn't bend the whole frame. That's why it was cast aluminum. And I welded it back together and it held up just fine for several hundred thousand miles till the guy sold the truck and then I lost track of it. And that doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean it's right. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It means in the meant in that particular moment it worked. Yeah. But there are certain things you can learn. There's a lot of good information uh, online. There is uh, there is uh, information from uh, a really big uh, welding machine and wire manufacturer. It's all it's all red. Starts with an L. They have a pamphlet like 72 pages about Lexus all the. It is. <laughs> what is it? Lexus. Lexus it is, huh? What the heck else could that be? Lincoln. I was kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they have a pamphlet like 72 pages. Of course, nobody reads it. It shows you the heat treat levels, it shows you the alloys, it shows you what welds with what wire. The key is to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Boating, for example, a lot of marine grade aluminum is like uh, um, uh, 50, 86. Uh, you weld it with the 5000 series wire. Mm -hmm. Of course, there may be special wires for that. On lower grade pontoon boats, it's like a 50, uh, 52. So, I mean, you, you kind of, then there is the non weldable alloys, mm -hmm. like the 2 and 7000 series, like the aircraft aluminum that is just being riveted or epoxy glued that is like not weldable at all. I got something to add. So on a similar note, if someone brings you something aluminum and it's riveted together or it's maybe bolted together, odds are that's not going to be weldable aluminum. Pete here actually taught me this as well. Uh, the reason for this, if I remember what you told me like several years ago, is that, you know, if you're, let's say you're building a truck body or whatever, it might be faster to have some guy standing there with his push-pull MIG gun and just all the way down and then it is for someone to drill a bunch of holes and then psh, 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 with the rivet gun it takes uh, more time and therefore more money to build something that's uh, riveted together as opposed to welded together so if you see something riveted together and it's broken it's probably not the best idea to actually weld that stuff and although it could stick and appear like, appear like it would be working and you can see it flowing together 
the weld has pretty much no strength on these grades of aluminum Definitely. if done with make or TIG. Yeah, it's um, that's one thing. It's only come in handy a couple times, but it's come in handy. Good. Yeah, file that away, and I bet it'll help you guys too at some point. All right, that was our quick tech tip from Lance and Peter. Not sponsored by anybody. Heck yeah. All right, thanks for coming down. It's great to see you. Hope this video helps you out. Ten and a half minutes. Not bad.